Hello and welcome to the Fully Charged Show podcast. Very, very happy to be here. I am a little bit Yoda-ish there. The gist of it is it's just been the most amazing last couple of weeks because I bought a book. I just want to make this clear because occasionally when you uh, interview someone who's written a book, you're sent the book by the publisher or whatever, the PR people. No, I wasn't having any of that. I went out and I bought this Material World by Ed Conway. And you can see how far I've got through it. It's really dense. It's um, But I can't leave the damn thing alone. It goes everywhere with me. I've got it all the time because I'm can't, I've just become a little bit obsessed with it. I'm just going to just quickly before we start, because Ed is extraordinary and you're going to love this episode. It is brilliant. But I just want to read a couple of things out. We extract 40. <laughs> I love this fact. Bear with me. It's all relevant. Uh, we extract 43 billion tons of sand and gravel every year in this in the world. Uh, we extract 8.1 billion tons of oil and gas every year. 8.1 billion tons what do we do with that we burn it just i'll just going to mention that we extract still to this day 7.7 billion tons of coal which we burn we and then we extract 3.1 billion tons of iron ore now if you just said to me what's the most extracted thing in the world i'd have just immediately said iron ore because i've been to iron ore mines and i've seen iron ore extraction quarries and they just huge and the machinery that they use to extract them is huge and everything about it is huge that's quite a diddle it's quite diddly you know what is big is sand and gravel which is obvious we use that in buildings so there's a lot of that we use sand as we will discover for many things um oil and gas we know about that's what this show is about how we try and gently reduce the amount of oil and gas we burn which we are doing as you will learn uh coal i was horrified to see how much coal we're still extracting and burning in 2023 unbelievable and iron ore is only 3.1 it's like nothing and then after that you look at the metals after that and it's diddly squit it's like four ounces no it is it's t thousands of tons but it's not billions and billions of tons which is what we, we have a very distorted view of how of the materials we use, where they come from, and what they're used for. And that book, ladies and gentlemen, I cannot recommend it highly enough, but by Ed Conway is a an extraordinary journey into the stuff that we do on this planet and why we do it and what it's for and what we did used to do and what we're doing now. So uh, please do check out fullycharged.show for all the latest information about our live events, Amsterdam being the next one, and after that, Sydney in Australia. Um, and please do tell your friends about this podcast and please do subscribe. All those boring things. Relevant and critical, but kind of annoying. But I thought I'd just mention that before we dive in. So please welcome to the Fully Charged Show podcast. Ed Conway. So, Ed, for a start, thank you very much for finding time in your busy schedule to talk to us. It's, no, it's it's an honor. It's a genuine honor. Thank you. No, <laughs> we must it really be, is. You mustn't be too, really is. too congratulatory of each other. But it is. I mean, this has been. Um, so, there's two books I've read this year: uh, Blue Machine by Helen Chesky, which I, if you Love haven't it. read it, I can really recommend it. It's brilliant. She is an extraordinary writer. That was hard enough. Got through that. Then your, then I bought I bought your book for money. I just want you to know this. I didn't hassle Thank for you a so copy. much. A sale. Paid money a sale. <laughs> so you definitely had one sale. Um, and it has really messed me up because I cannot put the damn thing down. And I keep oh, no. carrying it with me. And it's quite a big book. It's quite it's quite, it's quite heavy. heavy, isn't it? It's quite material. I, actually, the one thing I forgot to tell you is I was on the tube the other day in London and I missed my stop by two stops and i had to go oh i had to go around walk up the thing go back down the other side because i was that's in amazing the that's the book. best that's but the best thing i could hear so thank you but it is i mean it is it is right up my alley i suppose for a start but it's so yeah. it relates so strongly to what we're talking about and i think it is this is a my observation i don't remember hearing about or people talking about or my dad or my uncle discussing the source of the steel for their ford zephyr and their, their, their rover. Yeah. You know, when I was right. a kid, it was not discussed. It, it was never talked no. about. Where does the fuel come from? Oh, well, I thought, I became aware of it in the 70s, fuel crisis. 
and it seems to be, and I mean, this is probably me because I live in a little bubble of this, but people are suddenly going to going, well, what about the lithium extraction? That's really yeah. serious. Well, yeah. yes, of course it is. Yeah, I it's think like that's, I think that's exactly aware yeah. that we extract materials to live in the world we live in. Yeah, we've been doing this for thousands of years. Like that's yeah. is what defines us as a as a species. You know, we take stuff yeah. out of the ground. You know, for better or for worse, and sometimes we mess things up along the way. Um, but we take stuff out of the ground, we turn it into kind of tools to to make our lives better yeah. and make the world a better place. And so there's nothing new whatsoever about it. And yeah, like you, I get a bit frustrated by that because it's like this this is the new aha the kind of you know trump card that a lot of people have about the energy transition oh look at you know all these materials no yeah. we, we've done it before and we'll do it again and definitely there are some there are some challenges no yeah. no getting away from it uh, and some big things we need to kind of get around get our heads around but also we're kind of coming at this the the great energy transition the electric revolution all of that in in i think this is what's different it's more enlightened i think I mean, you know, touch wood, we are somewhat more enlightened about our footprints than previous generations yeah. were. Yeah. And as a result, maybe we're just thinking about that a bit more. So maybe there's room for hope on that front yeah. as well. Yeah, I mean, we certainly should be more enlightened. We don't have any excuses now. I mean, you can sort of give, no. you can forgive people in 1920 when they were developing combustion cars because, they, didn't, yeah. you know, they didn't know and they what their research was there. But I just, before we do go on, I think it's worth, because a lot of our uh, listeners and viewers are overseas, can you just do a, super potted history of your of how you got to write this damn brilliant book that's ruined my life <laughs> well, I don't, sorry yeah sorry again um i don't i mean like there's there's lots of ways i could kind of come at that i mean i so i i like i'm sure a lot of your listeners and viewers i i bought an electric car, car uh i bought it a while ago actually in 2017 um and and I kind of always thought, well, where where does I, I feel I feel slightly virtuous to have this car? Also, it's a nice car, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. But more importantly, I just wanted to understand where the stuff came came from. And and gradually, and there were a few other incidents that I talk about in the book, the kind of moments where I was like, bloody hell, okay, that's that's what it takes to get stuff out of the ground. But yeah. I like I feel as someone who inhabits quite a, a world of services, you know, I, I, I'm a journalist and I, I kind of talk about data and I explain things to people most of the time. It's totally intangible, you know, and you can lure yourself into thinking when you inhabit that world that nothing physical really matters. And as a result, and, and you order something, you know, a laptop or, or, or an electric car, it just turns yeah. up and, you know, yeah. there's not much explanation as to how it was made. And partly, I just think that's that's the world that we, and it's a sign of success that we are in now, where we don't think that much about what it takes to make the stuff yeah. that we use. And that go, goes obviously for, for new stuff. But I think, like you were saying, it goes for old stuff as well. And, you know, there are some people who used to think about how you make, get the steel that goes into cars. Funnily enough, Henry Ford, you know, the the, the godfather of, of kind of early car manufacturing was obsessed with where the steel was going to come from. He, right. he bought the iron ore mines. He bought the places where he could get the lime to make some of the concrete that was going in, all of this stuff. He even tried to to make a rubber plantation in Brazil called Fordlandia, this place oh, that's right. off in I the jungle in the that. Amazon. It's this, there's an amazing book about that, Fordlandia. Yeah. And and so it's it's not like some people haven't been thinking about this stuff, but I just think as a as a population, increasingly yeah. we've become divorced from that physical thing. So partly this was for me like a journey to try to understand, okay, what is the stuff that really matters in the world? Where do we get it out of the ground? What do we do to it to turn it into the products we're using every day, whether it's kind of plastics or for that matter, electric car batteries or the 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 sails that, that go onto onto wind turbines, everything basically. So so I set myself quite a terrifyingly large yeah. Kind of task but just try to understand that a little bit more and obviously this is not by any means the definitive guide but it's it by 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 writing it and researching it i found myself this is going to sound a little bit kind of airy fairy but i kind of found myself kind of reconnecting a little bit you know i think we're kind of like there's a lot of people who feel you've got these maker movements who want to make stuff and want to understand you know how they actually you know build things they want to cook their own food they want organic produce they want to feel like they're connected with the world i think that speaks to something deeper we've we've lost touch with this physical world that we inhabit to some extent we're on our phones you know twiddling away and a lot of us just want to reconnect this started to help me to to reconnect with the physical world because now when i look at you know any device i've kind of got stuff in front of me now when i look at it and i touch it i have that little bit more of an understanding about what it took to get it from the earth 
and also the footprint that it that it left along the way, which, by the way, is pretty bloody enormous most of the time. Enormous, yes. I mean, I think also I, what I loved about it was the, the the two first chapters were about things that I was, you know, you could not be more familiar <laughs> with, and yet I knew yeah. nothing. The history of that, yeah. so sand sand and salt. Because when I went I there, I went, what's he talking about? Where's yeah. the stuff about copper and iron and lithium and yeah. uh, oil? But that yeah. wasn't, you got all those, but sand and salt. Yeah. Absolutely that was quite intentional to leave to, to our lives, isn't it? And it's quite intentional to like leave this kind of sexy stuff like lithium to the end because yeah, actually yeah. everything else is on a kind of foundation and you're building further and you know, kind of more yeah. and more on that foundation. And in a way, the 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 fact the book so the book goes through all these materials, um, sand, salt, iron, copper oil and lithium and there's a kind of arc of understanding about the world that we inhabit right now so from sand you know we're talking about glass the world's first kind of high technology manufacture you know thousands yeah. of years ago and the irony is and you'll have you'll have seen this kind of already these things echo throughout the book and you'll see that yeah. you know even when you get to lithium you're you're like oh god that's how they make salt as well and there's there's all of these different echoes that go throughout coming back to that point you made at the start about this this there's no, there's nothing new here. We're just, no. we, we are not, there's not a revolution to be, you know, kind of getting lots of stuff out of the ground and turning it into batteries. It's an evolution. Um, and by understanding the pitfalls of what we've done in the past, you know, whether it's how we manage the, the glass industry, how we make concrete, you know, how we rediscovered the recipe for concrete, because we, we, we lost the recipe for concrete for hundreds of years <laughs> and then really? had to I rediscover just... it all over again. And so yeah. all of these things, by the way, which a lot of people thought we'd never be able to achieve, um, give you a kind of better background to some of the, the, the stuff we're going through right now, as well as being just interesting, because like concrete, like you, I thought, well, there couldn't be anything more boring than concrete. Yeah. And actually, it turns out that it's it's totally fascinating. Scientists still haven't worked out exactly what's happening inside cement when it's setting. Cement being the wow. kind of the glue that, that that goes inside concrete. And and as a result, we we you know we're still we're still trying to you know we're still building upon that old ground. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, because the, the, I, well, as soon as I got into the salt chapter, I got it because I got, of course, silicon. And uh, my uh, uh, brother-in-law is a used he's, he's retired now, but he used to work in a clean room. So he's one of the people in the oh. white suit, with the tube, making you know incredibly. So they were kind of creating the original dyes for chips. I don't even know what he did. He oh, did wow. something with. But you know, he worked in one of those super clean rooms in the UK. It was mainly for I think military and satellite. Uh, stuff not fascinating not for yeah, we did and... we did used to do a lot of that i yeah. mean that's the other thing in the uk we've kind of forgot we've we've stopped we've stopped making stuff to 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 you know we was there's, there's still actually quite a big manufacturing sector yeah. in fact actually one of the this this random thing that i just remembered the other day i went to visit some place in birmingham where they make this little it used they used to make pen nibs so like fountain pen right. nibs it's a company called brandau um despite the german name it's it's a british company from the midlands uh, born and bred and they used to make little fountain pen nibs with tiny little bits of metal, very, very kind of accurately pressed yeah. um, thin bits of, of, of steel for the most part. Which and, and that skill of being able to minutely, to, to the micron, be able to, to wield this metal and turn it into right. exactly the shape you want, turns out to be quite important these days because those, people, those people, people are not using fountain pens as much. Um, they make little electrodes and little tiny parts out of it. And I, at one point, I picked up this electrode that they just pressed and plated and, and done all this stuff to. And I said, well, how many of these do you make? And they said they make hundreds of millions, literally hundreds of millions. And I said, what's wow. it for? It is for the electrode that goes inside your rear view mirror of your car and allows it to dim when someone dim. flashes it. So it's the auto dimming thing. And this single wow. factory in Birmingham makes 55% of the world's <laughs> electrodes that go into your rear view mirror. Yeah. And again, because no one kind of, gives much thought to this that that particular one's not in the book but there's so many different examples of these things that we just don't give much thought to how stuff is yeah. made we don't really understand as well the extent to which the world is connected and you know we are yeah. living in this enormous you know economic organism um yeah. where we are all totally kind of dependent on each other which which is a, a marvel and a thing that is 
both reassuring, but at the same and point, it's kind of yeah. scary, isn't it? Because yeah, yeah. we're living in this world that is really scary right now as we talk, you know, yeah. um, what's happening in the Middle East, what's happening uh, with Ukraine and Russia, what's happening possibly in, in the Gulf of Taiwan. It's like yeah. this, this, this is nerve wracking, but yeah. there's reasons also for hope. Yes, yes. Oh, well, that's good. I'm glad because I was, I was one gonna, or two. I was worried. There, there's a couple of bits in the book where I go, "Oh God, it was we're, we're screwed." I, yeah, you know? I found myself actually as I was writing it, and I, you'll probably find this as you know, kind of as as you continue through it. Um, I was just vast, kind of going going yeah. between terror and hope, and there is hope. Yeah. There genuinely is yeah. hope, and you know, yeah. in the conclusion, you see that it's it's that there is reason for hope. But there are also are reasons for being kind of nervous right now because I think I think this is the the one thing that is true. We've set ourselves such an enormous task to get to to net zero in this country yeah. and most other countries around the world. And I, I think when we set ourselves that task, we didn't know just what it would involve as an engineering challenge. And we're now only and an economic challenge. And we're now only kind of coming to grips with that. And it is it is a bit scary. And there is likely to be a backlash because. Yes. I think rightly because people didn't well, they weren't informed of what it would actually involve yeah. and how we navigate that is going to be you know that's going to be tricky and it's, yeah. it's that is the big challenge in the next kind of 10 years or so no absolutely and I mean I think that is the it, it, it's a you know a constant battle it's going to be and I mean the the forces ranged against us changing a bit and I mean I often totally, focus yeah. on fossil fuel but it isn't really that because you know people who work in the fossil fuel industry are just people with jobs you know they're not actually yeah. evil overlords you know but it is no. it is no you know, the there's no one with a button a button saying no. do a bad thing now yes, there's no. systemic there's systemic kind of problems no. and the more yeah it's kind of it's it's more knotty than one would like to think really isn't it have you yeah. have you you haven't got to the oil chapter yet i'm very, i'll be very interested no i've, to hear I've well i've did i've because i've cheated a bit and jumped forward because <laughs> i was just you know just before we spoke today i wanted to have a quick a quick look I mean, that was, I mean, I think the thing that came out of that, even a brief scan of that chapter, is how vulnerable our supplies yeah. are. That's, yes. I think, more over and above, you know, you can say, you can argue about climate change and the CO2 and the air pollution, and those things are all critically important. But I mean, having, you know, I, you're too young. I lived through the 70s. I thought it was brilliant because I was a teenager with a bike. And I thought it was right, funny. Yeah. You were mobile. Past, yeah. And I'd cycle past miles and miles of station, stationary cars being pushed by people to the, to God. a petrol station where you could buy a gallon, one gallon. You know, I saw that <laughs> happen. And it, the whole God. country fell on its knees when that happened. It was extraordinary. Yeah. And I had a moment, it's funny, I had a moment like that a couple of years ago where, do you remember we had the, there was the scare that we were going to run out of petrol. And so everyone was, uh, they were kind of rationing it and everyone was yeah. queuing up. I, I had to drive at that point. Uh, in, the, in the course of researching this book, actually, I drove up to Scotland uh, in my electric car. Um, yeah. And I had, I had great smugness as I drove past people as they were queuing up for their thing. Yeah. And, and, you know, there was no, no queues at all. This was obviously no, at the slightly earlier at the time. Yeah, I mean, it's a bit <laughs> harder now. Um, that was on the way to go to this, this random mine in Scotland where they make they get the sand, like a sand mine. Who, whoever thought of yeah. a sand mine, at least I didn't before doing this, but where they get uh, the sand that then goes into this amazing glass. It's like some of the purest sand in the world in this right. place miles from anywhere in Scotland. But they also, that sand then uh, gets processed into something called silicon carbide. And silicon carbide, as I'm sure you know, is like one of these ingredients that you can use in power silicon, which for yeah. things like inverters in electric cars, that yeah. that's much more efficient and that can add an extra kind of 10, 20 miles to your range. So this random mine in the middle of Scotland, Scotland miles from Scotland. anywhere yeah, in Scotland, yeah. which which was set up, by the way, because we ran out of sand to make glass during the Second World War. So that's the yeah. other great story, you know, the way these, these things echo. Now that is part of the story of how we get electric cars that have longer range and that are better. Yeah. It's just, I find that it's mind blowing on, on, yeah, on yeah. so many dimensions. And I just found that so many times under kind of exploring this, this world that I thought was relatively simple. It's much more complicated, but much more interesting and yeah. much more mind bending than you expect. Yes. Cause I remember, I think I started out being obsessed with this at the Cheltenham science festival, but a good 10 plus years ago where I was on a panel where, which was about, will electric vehicles ever work? It was one of those early, you yeah. know, whatever it'll it was. Never work the these guy, things. Yes, it'll never work. And I mean, it was mainly very, and the questions from the audience were fabulous. Uh, then, you know, it's, we've moved on. Were they, were they skeptical? 
Oh, God, 100%. I mean, just not even you know, sceptical shows a potential understanding and interest. No, this is just blanket denial. This is just... But it, anyway... But it's but hard. It the, is hard because your whole yeah. world is, is under... Th if you feel your whole and world you is hear, under threat... You hear that lithium... Uh, there's no lithium for all these fancy... You read that somewhere yeah. in some stupid thing. And then you ask that thing. But what was fantastic was the guy next to me was a geologist who was working with... I think then Tesla and Ford and uh, and and he some and an old man said, well, what, you, what about all the lithium you need for your fancy electric cars? And this guy said, oh, I, I'm not worried about the lithium. What about the iron, the rubber, the steel? Da, da, da. And he did this list of the <laughs> copper, da, 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 the, the, the nickel, the manganese. That you know, he did his yes. list, and I went, oh my god, we had long conversation yes. afterwards. But. but that, but that is it. It's like uh, actually, obviously, lithium is incredibly important. And what's interesting actually about lithium. Is it? It's not like you say. It's not like it's scarce. You know, we're gonna, yeah. we're not gonna run out of lithium. It's no. more just about how you um, engineer an enormous increase in your mining of this thing that we haven't really mined much of before. It's just, yes. it's just a challenge, an engineering uh, challenge about being able to exponentially increase how we get get it out. But it's, it's in a, I'm, I'm actually more worried about copper than I am about yeah. about lithium. You know, I'm more worried that. I went one of the places I visited when when writing the book was this terrifyingly big mine in Chile called Chuquicamata, Chuquicamata, oh, yeah, yeah. and it is it is actually the world's biggest man-made hole. It is wow. enormous. It's terrifying. You stand on the edge and it looks it feels like a canyon. You know, you're being kind of you get that vertiginous feeling yeah. like you're being lured into it and you're like, oh, I'm going to get back from the edge. Um, and it's man-made. You know, we created right. it. It's got its own microclimate at the bottom. We created it. And we, we created it over the course of 100, 100 years or so. It's right. over 100 years old. And it satisfied our demand for a, the electrical wire that we have all around us. You know, there's probably some chukikamata, some atoms of chukikamata copper all in the device now. you're yeah, listening yeah. to this on because yeah. they go everywhere afterwards and they get kind of very recycled. There's, I, th I worked out it was something like four, one in 14 of every atom of copper that we have ever mined uh, came from that hole. Wow. So it's wow. mental. But the, but the point is, if we're going to get to net zero, we need a lot more of those holes. In fact, we yeah. need like three more chukikamatas every Mine's year. Well, oh, every oh. year oh. until 2050. You yeah. know, like, and, and, and so when you think about that and you kind of stand on the edge of it and just like, well, blimey, then you realize the scale of, of what we're, we're facing. And the difficulty, and I think the discomfort of this is that these places are dirty and they're, they're not yeah. very pleasant places to be in. And yet we need more of them in order to make the world cleaner. And I think to me, to a lot of people, you know, to some people, let's say, that's a reason to say, oh, this is just too difficult. You know, why are we doing yeah. this? It's too much of a challenge. For me, it's just like, that's the reality. It's knotty. It's uncomfortable. It's interesting. Yeah. So we need to face up to it. And I think, unfortunately, there's a lot of people who understandably just want the world to feel simple. You know, we can't yeah. do this, so let's not do it. Um, or we're going to do this. It's going to be easy. But I think we all just instinctively, at least part of us, knows that it's tricky somewhere to navigate somewhere, yeah. that real path. And that's what I was frustrated about before writing this book. I was like, why are we not just like talking pragmatically about that? you know, middle path of how we actually get things done. And and this is an effort to to start to do that. You know, it does it's yeah. it's it's just yeah. a beginning, you know. But it's uh it and then and by all along the way then we start to understand a little bit more about how the gadgets and gizmos we use in this world actually came to be. I mean I I wanted to understand how a silicon chip was made. You know, yes. not just Definitely. not just the kind of amazing whizzy stuff that happens in Taiwan, but literally you know, it's a, it's a, perhaps a stupid question. Just physically, when you touch a silicon chip, where does the silicon come from? Yeah. And all sorts of and people I silicon? spoke to. Yeah. And yeah. what is silicon? And all sorts of people yeah. in the industry I spoke to were like, well, I, I, don't, I don't know. Let me tell you about photolithography. Look, oh, I, so they didn't know it? either. They, they yeah. didn't know. And then, and then I keep saying, well, but, but the silicon, where's the silicon from? And they'd say, uh, well, you know, it's sand. It's sand. And... Um, and it turns out it's not really sand. You know, there's, it's a very particular type of silicon that comes out of the ground in very particular places. And yet people at the very top of that supply chain, it's an incredible supply chain, you know, going all around the world millions of times, all for these devices that we hold in our pockets. But people at the top have no idea about the stuff that's going on at the bottom. And that, to me, again, shows a slight, you know, I, it, it's great. It's the, world, the way the world works. No one has to think about it because it's so incredibly complex. But it's bloody interesting. You know, it really is yeah. interesting to, 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 to know the journey that these 
commonplace devices have been on before they arrive in your hands. I think that's kind of exotic and exciting. Yeah. So I try yeah. to do, you know, I, I think this is the first description in one of the cha- first chapters, uh, chapter three, the first description of that full supply chain of how a I silicon do. chip yeah. Uh, kind of gets in your into your hands and goes all around the world. And by the way, it's the same for solar panels, which which is the same yes. technology. Yeah, but actually, I mean, I think to to uh, that point, I think was the ori- that notion was the original spark that made me think I want to do something about you know electric vehicles. And uh, this is in t- two thousand nine. So I mean, there were like two or three like manufactured electric vehicles. They were all pretty rubbish. The Tesla Roadster was impressive, but had huge drawing. I don't know yes. if you've been on. Really uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, just, it, it, just and it's, it's kind curve. of a Lotus with lots of weight added to it. Yeah. and, and, and I think it's de- definitely designed for someone who's about five foot four, <laughs> because the the you know I, uh, Jack Scarlett, who we work with, is six five. He's fine in it because his head's right above the windscreen. It's like the windscreen's there. He's there. So he's got really good visibility. I'm at the worst height. Except so when he bar, opens his eyes. Yeah, the bar at the top of the windscreen is literally like there. So you're going, is, is there a car there? <laughs> anyway, but what what had happened was I did a series called How Do They Do It? And one of those episodes was uh, oil refining. And I went to the big oil refinery in Pembrokeshire. I can never remember the name, but Pembroke. Oh, it's a beautiful yeah, area. Yeah, yeah. Really big. It's one of the three big ones in the country. Yes absolutely i mean it's just like you when you went to these places you're just kind of overwhelmed and fast it's huge it uses more electricity yes. than coventry that's <laughs> all these <laughs> facts i learned <laughs> and they make so much stuff there all the jet fuel used at heathrow it goes yeah. literally from a pipe there down the m4 to heathrow extraordinary facts like yeah. that amazing really and amazing people working there and about a year or two years after i was there they had an accident. I had an explosion. I know three of the engineers that I met were killed in that explosion. Oh, I mean, gosh. it's also dangerous. Gosh, uh, it's it quite a bad fire they had there. I would think uh, t- about f- eighteen years ago. But gosh. that made me think. Oh, and then I saw a tanker come in as well. So I saw a tanker. We filmed a tanker arriving from Saudi, with, right. with um, and they call it what do they call it? Sweet crude, don't they? So it's the yeah, it's they sweet light stuff. crude. Sweet light. That's, yeah, that's what you want. The sweet light stuff. Sweet like stuff. But what was amazing with that was, oh, as I, as the, the my very slow cogs turn, I went, oh, wait a minute. So when I get petrol in a petrol station, that's not where it comes from. I mean, so yes. dumb, but, yeah, no, but normal because you don't yeah, think about it. And we're encouraged to think that way. And, you know, yes. I, yeah, it's, I think it's not, there not, we're actively hmm. encouraged to think that way. I think yeah. we are. And I mean, to some extent, like I say, that's kind of a, a sign of success, isn't it? Because it's like, well, you don't, don't you trouble yourself with all yeah. this, you know, because we'll take care of that and it'll just turn up. And that's, yeah. it's one of the, 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 you know, the triumphs of capitalism. Yeah. But by the same token, we lost something, I think, along the way. Um, I mean, not on, on refineries. I think we talk, talked on, on, on Twitter about this. Uh, on refineries, I had one of those moments as well. I went to this one in Humberside. I mean, I, I've become weirdly because it's a totally weird thing to be obsessed with, but I kind of love refineries. Also, <laughs> yeah, they're, 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 awful, you know, they're kind of, you know, obviously this they're vision awful, of, of, yeah. of, of, of uh, the, the, the worst stuff. Yet by the same token, un, unexpectedly, you come across stuff every so often that like, makes you think, oh, it's a bit more complicated than that. And yeah. one of these places was in, in Humberside, the Humber Refinery. Same kind of thing. It's like, you know, you've got fire, flames belching everywhere. It stinks. It's, you know, honestly noxious in yeah. there and you're thinking this is oh this is literally hell i'm inside hell and then it turns out that what they do at humber is the stuff at the very bo- bottom of the barrel because basically with oil refinery refining they're, they're getting all of these different fractions and distillates out of your out of your crude oil so it's called crude yeah. oil because it's crude it's, it's it yeah. comes out of the ground uh, and then you need to kind of purify it make it less crude and petrol goes out the the top and some some gases and so on but the very bottom there's this extra kind of heavy tarry stuff which they bake into a kind of Coke. So it looks a bit like coal, basically. Right. And then that stuff is called, I think, anode Coke or graphite Coke. And that goes off to China and it gets turned into graphite, synthetic graphite. And that becomes the anode inside yeah, batteries. Battery. So okay. if you're holding, you know, if you're holding an iPhone, then there is a very good chance that it has some North Sea oil in it in the form of that anode and increasingly here's the thing increasingly okay there's graph the no one talks about the graphite side of the battery because it's not sexy because it's not lithium and it's not cobalt yeah. and it's not nickel and any of those things it's very unfashionable but the graphite 
Okay, you've got natural graphite that you mine out of the ground, and then you've got synthetic graphite, which is this stuff. It comes from oil. The synthetic graphite, in other the oil, um, is becoming more and more important because I think this is what some, how someone explained it. Synthetic graphite is basically better for faster charging batteries because it allows your lithium ions to go and nestle better within within the matrix of the the um, of the structure there, the atomic structure of graphite. So. There's lots more synthetic graphite in the world. Therefore, we need more oil. And these yeah. places like um, the Humber refinery, which, by the way, is the only place in Europe which can do this at scale, which is another, yeah. it goes back to this other whole other narrative, which is why on earth don't we have more battery factories and more battery yes. manufacturing in this country? It's crazy. We, we had that place. So you could make the anodes in this country. But the problem is that turning that coke into graphite is really energy intensive and quite carbon intensive. And so right. there's like a disincentive to do it here. So we ship it all off to China and then buy China. back the batteries later. And then later. blame them. Then and we then blame, blame them Chinese. for the emissions. Yeah. But, you know, and also we had we had really great chemicals companies, you know, again, with a spotted history, let's be honest about it, of, of, of environmental um, catastrophes in the past. But nonetheless, people who are pretty good at making things like the lithium electrolyte that you need to go into batteries, making the the separators that could go between those different electro, uh, electrodes and batteries. So there was, there was a big hope in the UK that we had all the ingredients. And then the government just wasn't especially into it. And uh, China, China, more importantly, China has just dominated that. It's the same it. for yeah. the US as well. You know, the US hasn't made as many batteries as as it could have because that it's, you know, China just so dominant uh, in yeah. the battery sphere. But yeah, so to go back to your point, oil, oil refineries turn out to have all of these unexpected stories, some of which are, you know, there's we need oil refineries yeah. if we are going to have batteries in the future. And who would have thought yeah. that, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, I mean, in a sense, that's, I've made that argument rather flippantly, but I think it does have some validity in that my argument is that I think we should stop burning oil, but we shouldn't stop extracting it and using it. Totally. But the problem, the problem is, and I've, you know, I, as I say that in the talk, <laughs> I'm actually doing one this evening. Um, I know that, the, 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 that in order to refine that crude oil into all those different elements, some of which are pharmaceuticals, uh, yeah. uh, fertilizers, as you, you've just described, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, graphine, graphene, uh, graphite, all those things, you've, you, if you didn't burn any oil, you've got millions and millions of gallons of petrol and diesel. That's the thing. You're just gonna, yeah. What are you going to do with that? <laughs> it's it a good is ecosystem, that isn't it? Yeah, like yeah. there's this, uh, the, the, the barrel of oil, the, the bit that we thought was important before was obviously petrol, and it's still incredibly important, petrol and kerosene. Yeah. Like it or not, it's still 80% of, 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 of global oh, energy God, is yeah. fossil fuels. Um, but we're, we're, we're whittling that down. But as we whittle it down, yeah, the other stuff in the barrel becomes more important. I mean, there, there yeah. are lots of exciting things kind of going on, like you might in future be able to use silicon in the anodes and you might have a kind of uh, a solid state kind of lithium yes. uh, battery, lithium yeah. metal. But I think one of the other kind of lessons I've I've learned, at least from going down this 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 wormhole, is that it's not really enough just to be have the whizziest technology that works in a laboratory. It's also about yeah. being able to turn this stuff out in immense numbers. And, yeah. you know, that that's why concrete has become such an important part of the world. It's not necessarily because it was the single best, the best thing. recipe yeah. for making things. It was just actually really scalable and it's quite yeah. easy to, lay, to put down concrete. And by the way, that's part of the challenge is that there are quite a lot of low carbon concrete for backgrounds um, is a massive uh, emitter of carbon Huge. so the, yeah. the process of making cement uh and it's and it's very very hard to get around it because it's not just that you need a lot of heat because you can you can use like a sustainable fuels to, to heat yeah. it rather than coal which is the way it used to be done in the past you've got a big kiln that's running at like you know one and a half thousand degrees uh it's got to be hot that side of it it's okay but the other side of it is literally taking the the, the lime that you're that you're turning into the cement there's a chemical reaction where it just emits really a truckload too. a shed load of co2 right. and there's a that's the thing there's a chemical kind of barrier there that make, makes it difficult anyway there are and so so it's about six percent of our global emissions is, is concrete which sounds it, crazy isn't it it's much much more than problem. aviation much more yeah. than aviation is just concrete um but while there are quite exciting you know, breakthroughs in how we make low carbon concrete that are happening in labs at the moment. It's quite difficult to scale them up. You yeah. couldn't just put them in a building site. That's pr what you've got to pragmatically yeah. think about is like, how do you get this? And there was, there's one where you, it's, it, it's, it's amazing. It's like, I think it's a negative, 
it's got negative and net emissions, this type of um, concrete. And right. people are going on about it saying, look, and it sets exactly like concrete and it looks like concrete. And over time, it actually sucks carbon dioxide in from the atmosphere because wow. concrete does this, by the way. But uh, all the concrete buildings you're, you see around you, they're, they're, concrete's so much more sexy. I, I, we could talk, by the way, for another hour about concrete. Just, like, just and, concrete. It would, but it's because it's not very sexy, but actually, you know, you look at it and it is. Did you know, okay, the concrete buildings in London, everyone looks at them and go, bloody concrete, you know, all this stuff. Although I, you know, there's, I quite like brutalist yeah. architecture. But the the sand that they that they use, for the most part, to get the concrete in London comes out from the North Sea. And they dredge it from Dogger Bank. You know Dogger Bank from wow. shipping news. Yeah. And Dogger Bank, of course, was an old drowned island that used island. to connect. Yeah, yeah. It used to connect the UK and Europe. It's this drowned, amazing drowned medieval land where you still find mammoth tusks and old Neolithic axes and things. So the concrete in London is part is made from the sands of a drowned land, wow. long forgotten from years that. ago. Wow. So. But so it's, it's constantly. Also they, it's also where they're putting in the biggest wind turbines that have ever also, been installed yes. in the world. Yeah. Yes, but, exactly, anyway, and it's, and, and it's, which are going to produce enormous amounts uh, of, of power. So so dog bank. Stick with concrete good. for a moment. <laughs> but, but to stick with concrete, yeah, I'm halfway through my concrete thing. Um, so so it's all, it's constantly when you see those blocks of concrete in you know whatever city you are, they are just sucking a little bit imperceptibly because it's this wow. chemical reaction that you do to make the cement is going in reverse. So they're sucking tiny bits of carbon uh yeah. into them carbon dioxide the problem is that you you emit far more when you're making it when so in net it, terms yeah. it's definitely a net big emitter it's, it's, but, it's a bit like a co2 regen when you're going downhill in an electric car yeah <laughs> you exactly get, you exactly. get about 10 percent of what you use going up the hill yeah i've always i've always kind of I, I always fantasized about being going down the hill and starting. Have you ever managed that to go down the hill and start with more, uh, be at the bottom of the hill and have your percentage be slightly higher than you were at yes, the top? Yes, I have. But, uh, yes, it's a long story. But yeah, in the Alps uh, with an extraordinarily okay. unhappy wife. Because <laughs> we could have gone through the tunnel, but we went over the top. When she worked that out, it was a, quite a quiet journey. And you were like, but just time. look, look at the number. Yeah. <laughs> look at the chart. <laughs> yes. So we did, we, we we did 100. We did 152 kilometers with 42 kilometers of range in a in a Tesla Model S. See, when I, a long time ago. That's I mean. But what was annoying with the I would Tesla, have been happy. It, yeah, it was so it was so fulfilling. But we didn't. It doesn't show you the increase. I've talked to Tesla engineers. Oh. So the way they're, they're on, on that car. I don't know whether it's different now. What it did was that the the 42 kilometers didn't go down for right. 120 kilometers, it just stayed at 42. So uh, I knew it was That's quite doing unnerving. Stuff. And, and the battery definitely, the battery, nothing changed. It looked like yeah. we were stationary. Yeah. And yet we were driving along an autobahn. God, that's, and, and, that's, yeah. But that's I mean, it was, a, it was a beautiful sunny hot day down in the valley in Switzerland. <laughs> uh, uh, five degrees and raining, because we were in the clouds at the top of the San Bernard Pass and 38 degrees at the uh, Aosta supercharger in Italy. So we went from, it was such yeah, a, and, and she was and, and just, a long I don't way blame her. Generated, yeah. yeah, no, I, I mean, my wife would probably feel similarly uh, if I had done did that. But to go back to the concrete, anyway, point, yeah. so, so there's this, um, you know, there's this amazing kind of new concrete, which actually is almost carbon, carbon negative. But here's the problem. In order to lay that concrete down in a building site, you need to, it needs to be laid down like in a, in a kind of carbon dioxide, in a, in a, like a vacuum filled with carbon oh. dioxide. And so can you imagine that actually working in pragmatic wow. terms that yeah. you'll build it? You know, if you're doing a kind of home extension and someone comes in to lay yeah. the floor down, it's just, that that's the thing. So understanding yeah. kind of about these practical obstacles to, to all of these technologies turns out to be kind of really important and understanding why it's difficult to make steel in vast quantities without emitting carbon turns out to be really important because we need a lot of yeah. steel to, to build lots of wind turbines, for instance. Yeah. And so... This you can't you can't really you know have a sophisticated sense of all the the sexy stuff like lithium and cobalt and so on, without also kind of understanding the seemingly boring stuff, which as as you now know is not that boring, like concrete yeah. and steel and all of the rest of it. Um, and that's why I think I think you need the whole span. That's you know that's why this book is about all all yeah. that stuff as well as the other stuff as well. And as you as you all have seen. But I mean, that's it. so. The, I would just like, because there's a couple of other sort of key things I want to ask you about and talk about. But I think I would love to do oil because yeah. 
particularly, I mean, well. particularly because when you describe the like the massive uh, terminal in Saudi, that's, yes. uh, that's, uh, you know, the, yeah, and that's how vulnerable, right. how sort of mi- militarily vulnerable that is, and how how it's we are yeah. hugely not not this country, the world is hugely the world. hugely dependent on that massively, and where right, that and, oil goes to, and right now, right now as well, because you know that 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 particular bit of the book is really is is super relevant now because. Both, both the Saudi terminal, which exports the most oil in the world, and also right. possibly even more importantly, Ras Lafan, which is the Qatari gas terminal, right. yes. um, which, 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 by the way, that field that Qatar is sitting over, it's called the North Field. It's extraordinary. The, I, to, I mentioned, yeah, I wrote notes about that. So, yeah, so it's, it's the single biggest energy source on the planet. The single biggest energy source on the planet. But here's, yeah. here's the kind of kicker, which is that both of those two places are in range of Iranian missiles. Right. And Iran doesn't isn't very happy with either of those two countries, Saudi and, yeah. and, and Qatar. We're, we're going into a period now where it's very scary in the Middle East. And, and it's yeah. we could be getting, you know, if, if things spread, then Iran could become involved. And if that happens, then then what next? Because this yeah. like it or not, we still need petrochemicals and yeah. indeed fuel from from oil for a long time in fact you know even on the most optimistic kind of projections of where we get to in net net zero in 2050 we still need quite a lot of oil even though we're yeah. offsetting a lot of those emissions with other things like it or not it's like that's if, yeah. if you want to have a world where civilization kind of more or less carries on like it does right now there's debates about whether you want to do that or not you kind of need that stuff and yeah. so yeah I'm, I, I'm quite i'm quite nervous at the moment about that because yeah there's a there's a the, the Middle East as a as a scary thing, and oil as an important part of the global economy it hasn't yeah. gone away. You know, it hasn't no, gone away no. at all. No, not at all. Yeah, and I mean, yeah, because I, I mean, those sort of arguments about, uh, oh, well, your car was built because of oil. You know, it, yes, <laughs> so is everything else we've got. So is everything. You know, we we are. I mean, I, even if everything. I if I walk in recycled organic Hessian shoes to <laughs> Tesco's. <laughs> <laughs> to buy a lettuce that lettuce Somewhere has been the delivered there at the very least in a diesel truck from a big warehouse that's heated by or yes. cooled by you know you, we are all yeah. totally dependent on it and it's probably it's probably been grown in in a, a greenhouse which has been heated by yeah. by gas yeah. by gas power you know by the way those greenhouses where they make where we grow our cucumbers and our tomatoes and yeah. things they they are kind of incredible because um they're incredible but they're also again it's another kind of fossil fuel thing um yeah. They, not only do they heat them with big boilers with with kind of heated uh, fueled by gas, but they take the CO two that comes out of the the chimney of those of those boilers, and they direct the CO two into the greenhouse, right. raising the CO two level, and that then helps. So it's I don't know, it's kind of a thousand parts per million rather than you know yeah. five hundred or whatever the ambient kind of amount is, and as a result, you get faster photosynthesis because uh, yeah. yeah, and and and. Uh, by the same token, you need the gas to make the fertilizers that go in because nitrogen fertilizer is made from gas. And yeah. so when you, yeah, I'm, I'm, like it or not, when you eat a tomato, for the most, you're probably consuming something that one way or another you is a Qatari fossil fuel gas. product. And again, you can despair at that or you can just say, yeah. okay, let's now I understand the world. Let's think about how we can yeah. make it more sustainable. And that's yeah. you know, kind of my vibe. I mean, there are certainly. I mean, I've, we uh, we haven't filmed them yet, but there's definitely uh, there's a company in the Netherlands with you know like nineteen thousand acres of gla- uh, of ground under glass, and it's powered by wind turbines and solar panels. You know, they've yes. made that attempt to sort of. It's you know, doable. Their, it's definitely yeah. doable. And 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 but I also, bet they're injecting CO two. I bet they're doing the same thing from maybe. They probably from a are. Yeah. They probably are because it doesn't grow very fast without it. And definitely, yeah. kind of urban, you know, that those forms of agriculture are really uh, are promising in another way, which is that you're not having to scatter so much fertilizer on the ground. Yeah. You don't have to use as much pesticide. You're yeah, not having to do all the herbicides, focused, all of those yeah. things. So it is kind of better in most senses. But it's this kind of thing about not letting the perfect be the envy of the good. You know, we're yeah. kind of we. We're all just getting to a better place, and I do think the world gets is 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 a better place yeah. now. It's just along yeah. the way we make mistakes. The thing the thing I love is that so coal. Okay, so obviously coal is 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 the the most uh, evil of all fossil fuels. We all know that. Yeah. But the story of how we kind of came to start using coal is actually a story of how coal saved us from an environmental tragedy. 
which is that we were cutting down in this country. So this is where coal yeah. began, for better or for worse, mostly, for, I don't know, well, who knows? That's, there's another debate. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a step on a journey. I don't think we can it's a, judge it. It's a step. Know, any other term, yeah. So we were chopping down all our trees to make them into charcoal uh, to power our blast furnaces. Yeah. So that we, we were, it looked for a moment in the kind of 17th century, like the UK, uh, England in, uh, was going to run out of trees. We were going to chop yeah. down every single tree and we we're going to be completely deforested. And then along came coal and coal allowed those forests to to regrow because suddenly yeah. we could use coal to make our steel and to make our beer and our glass and all yeah. of these other things and then in the same way oil when oil came along it saved the sperm whale from extinction because yeah. up until then people were using sperm uh oil sperm whale oil uh as as a kind of for their lights for their lamps and then kerosene came along and suddenly we didn't need to go and slaughter all of these whales thank god and the same thing with like i don't, I don't know billiard balls used to be made from ivory and all those elephants yeah. were, were being slaughtered for the ivory and then along come plastics and allow us to make kind of you know petrochemical yeah. plastic billiard balls so each time and we save us save the environment and then end up causing a further problem and I, i'm no yeah. doubt i'm sure there'll be something with whether it's lithium or cobalt or nickel or some of these metals and things that we're using that could well threaten us in the future but this is yeah. part of being human it's our story isn't yeah. it we try yeah. and make it no. better each step along the way yes and i think that's i think that's the critical sort of background thing but i think the other sort of cr the crucial difference so the two things that i now focus on when i talk about electric vehicles to the general public you know which is always i always say electric cars won't save the world they're not the answer they're still cars they're made in yeah. factories of materials mm. we dig out the ground blah 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 blah. but over their entire life i think they're a, a better bet yeah and if then you drive the, it the enough, other one yes. i said that the two emerging things that have come out since i drove a mitsubishi i in 2009 is <laughs> the fact that that battery in that car is more useful when it's not being driven Think that's right when you're not using the car which and then when you look mm. at the statistics of how often you use a car it's about five percent of its working yeah. life so there yeah. so 95 percent of the time it's sitting there doing nothing it's, well if you've got a if you've yeah. got something in that car that could be used and that when you when we've we've just seen the beginnings of this realist where where it's on a plausible level which it where, where utrecht is the main one i know there's now they're now tr doing it with um school buses in america on a kind of industrial scale is right. the vehicle to grid capability so if yes. you think of school bus it is the perfect exquisite example of uh, a machine yeah, we all rely on that is used yeah. for these two periods it's uh, you average time they're in use is four hours a day two hours in the morning two hours in the afternoon the rest of the time mm. they're parked in big garages hundreds yeah. of school buses they're not doing yeah. anything that they're, they're, you know. they're batteries aren't they they're static batteries and they're batteries. for the rest of the time so the ones yeah. they're now doing they are now uh you know they are now multi megawatt hour storage are, are dotted around yeah. the country not needing grid upgrades because it's not all in one lump like a power plant it's yes. spread out so they are charging them off peak they're now starting to install wind turbines at the sites so they're charging them with yes. free in inverted commas electricity those yes. sort of things and the other one was in utrecht is the a company called We Drive Solar who have I don't know men now, but it's hundreds of car share cars with their own parking spaces all over the city, with a little post that you plug it in, and that uh, post is bi-directional. All the cars are bi-directional, so they so take power out, and they can well, do that on a centralised. Right. Yeah, it's really that. worth seeing that. It's, yeah. uh, that's really I mean, interesting. I think that is is yeah. that one, and then it's it's the capability. The one difference I think this that what we're doing now might have, and it's got to have, otherwise we should all give up, <laughs> is is re, is using the materials, particularly in batteries again, and that yes. technology has really leapt forward. And I think those two things are, yeah, it has, a yeah, possible, yeah. You know. you, and you've done you've done stuff on the grid, haven't you? Um, yeah, because the grid, every, the grid, that's the that's the fashionable thing. I, I've, I like to think I was saying this about two years ago, but the fashionable thing everyone's like, oh, well, you need we really need to talk about the, grids. Do you know that? You know, I'm grids. In the grid, the yeah. Thing. yeah, we talked about grids, and every everyone's talking about it. Even the chancellor. I talk to the yeah. chancellor quite a bit, and I talk to the shadow chancellor, and they're both they're both the grids. Have you heard about the grids? Um, so, uh, really. <laughs> Um, but have you talked? Because uh, I mean, it's when I talk to people who actually run the national grid, which I think are probably going to—they're going to know quite a bit. And I go, "So, is it? Are we screwed? Is it a problem?" And they go, "What?" And you go, "Well, like with all the electric cars." No. What are you, what are you talking about? <laughs> so, okay, not well, even. Really an issue. 
Yeah, although, no, although they, I, uh, well, you've yeah. got to go to the national grid. They're great. You know, yeah, they're yeah. Very, no, I, I, we're, actually, I've been talking to them. Though the funny thing is, like the 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 funny, scary, inspiring thing about grids is often even the technicians who are kind of working on them don't entirely understand oh, how what's they, going no. on. It's this like black magic about how electricity yeah. networks work and all of the frequencies and momentum, all, all of these it's different things. It's quite scary. Yeah, yeah. It's quite yeah. scary, but like oh, it's kind of amazing as well. This black magic. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like battery recycling is is such a big one. Yeah. And actually, just like you say, in a in a place in a kind of environment where rather than extracting things to burn, you're extracting them to build. So building, build. not burning. Yes. Then yeah. they become potentially reusable. And obviously, there's question marks about how what your scale, your kind of recycling yield is. And at the moment for lithium, it's basically zero. No one's able to kind of get that much out, but it's kind of, it's going to go up. And there's uh, there's a cha- whole chapter in the book on uh, on that. Funnily enough, actually kind of a lot of the refining that you use to recycle things just looks a lot like metal refining in the first place. So again, yeah. there's an echo back to, you know, if this is what we've been doing for ages. Um, the challenge there though, is that when when the first kind of sets of battery packs were being made, understandably, a lot of the car manufacturers were just terrified about them setting on fire, you know, and they still yeah. are, you know, they're still nervous about that. And it's, and so a lot of kind of adhesives and stuff um, were just thrown on them. And the packs were made as, as safe as they could. Yeah. And they were packed in as, 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 as kind of, you know, with as much protection as possible. And ironically, talking to people who do a lot of the recycling now, that is the hardest bit is Real dealing struggle. with these packs yeah. that were never designed to be recycled, no. where a lot of stuff was scattered on them to make sure that they wouldn't kind of go on fire. And there's yeah. a balancing act there in the future to try to make things that are more easily easy to kind of disassemble, but by the same yeah. token are still safe. Because the two yeah. things I think can can sometimes counteract each other. Um, but there is, yeah, and there's a lot of exciting companies who are who are doing that also kind of with there's this there's this company so redwood is the famous one which yeah, is the guy yeah. jb strawbell from from tesla has set up but there's a company in belgium called umicore have you heard of umicore yes i don't know anything about them but i have heard the name they, yeah. they so they, they have like one of the most fascinating stories they these days they actually make quite a lot of the cathode materials that go into right. into the batteries so umicore are providing lots of cathode materials for, for european car makers like vw and bmw and so on so so all the lithium and those those clever mixes that go onto the electrodes and batteries that that that's umicor it does does a fair bit of that right. these days at least outside of china they're pretty big but china obviously is by far and away the biggest but their history okay goes back to they're belgian they are the descendant company of uh, a company that used to be called union minier de haute katanga and they were the belgian company that used to do all of the mining in the congo wow and that's not a very happy history. No, a bet. lot of that yes. is, to put it lightly, that is not very happy stuff. And yet today, um, this company, they've obviously renamed themselves. I wonder why they did that. Yeah. Um, but this company today is possibly part of the the roadmap to, to being able to recycle these batteries. And so, right. again, it's the weirdness is, yeah. you know, <laughs> we can disavow some of these companies and their history. But yeah. they are now kind of transforming themselves into possibly part of the solution, possibly part of the solution. And there's quite a few of them like that that you see around. So while it's easy to demonize kind of oil companies, um, and I think we still have yet to see how sincere some of them are about the transition. Yeah. It's possible that they could well be, you know, it's possible and plausible they could be part of the solution in the future. But um, that's that's the kind of discomfort of of the real world, you know, the material yeah. world that we inhabit. Yeah. Um, because it, okay, we, we, the trouble is we could do 10 hours. We could do a 10 hour. <laughs> I'm happy to do 10 hours. You've got 10 hours. I'll do 10 hours. Yeah, 10 hours. <laughs> 10 hours. Sorry, guys. Yeah, this, this week's podcast is a bit longer than usual. <laughs> but I'd love to do the peak or the peak. I've just started peak oiling. But as in okay. reading about peak oil. Yeah. Is that because I always forget about that, that that I definitely the sort of um, uh, the, the hippie alternative society of the early 1970s, the kind of the kind of tail end of the hippie stuff. I was right yeah. at the beginning. I was the youngest person in any group of old hippies. So they would all they were all a bit older than me. But these are all like, <laughs> oh, it's going to run out, man. And we're going to go back to yeah. living on organic stuff. Big all world. that stuff that went yeah. on then was was you know based on the experience of what we were all going through at the time but not in a very 
it, it was in a very little insular world. You know, if yeah, you live in a farm, in, if you live in a trendy hippie farm in um, w- the Welsh mountains, you can go, yeah, man, we're going to really shrink down our footprint every time. <laughs> but then you go, but can we go to see the Ro- Rolling Stones in London and we need to go in a car on a motorway that's made of concrete over a bridge made of steel? You know, <laughs> but, but anyway, let's leave that. I, I was kind of always slightly torn. I think there was a short-haired uh, realist inside the hippie exterior when I was <laughs> Can you? But my bike's made of metal. <laughs> that's, yeah. But, well, uh, I, think but, that's, I think that's right. But, but, yeah. what, but we were always thinking oil's going to run out because yeah. we're burning so much of it. And all that's happening. There are still people who home. think that. There are still people yeah. who think we're going to. I mean, facing every year oil. we've burnt more oil than we've ever burnt before, and we continue yeah. to increase the amount. I know. I know. It hasn't I'm, run I mean, out. unfortunately, no. fortunately, unfortunately, it, it hasn't yeah. run out. And and actually, peak oil nowadays. If you talk about peak oil, probably it's, it's more likely to mean peak. Yeah, peak peak. Uh, demand rather than peak yeah. supply, yeah. Um, and that's a that's a massive that's that's a massive shift. But it comes back to like something that is that I again find kind of unnerving, is which is that in each of the previous energy transitions, whether we've gone from coal from wood to coal, from coal to oil, from oil to gas to nuclear, and all of these different things, we've been going up a thermodynamic ladder. So right. these each of these fuels has been more plentiful in terms of the energy that it holds and the energy that yeah. we can extract out of it. We've gone up the ladder. The difficulty with with net zero is we're going down the ladder. So when you're taking yeah. wind and you're turning it into stuff that goes into you know the power grid or into batteries, that is not as straightforward in terms of its thermodynamic, in terms of power to weight ratio and uh, energy density. And so um, we're, we're kind of going down the ladder and we're trying to do it quite quickly. Um, and the, 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 the promise is we have a cleaner world and we have a more sustainable world. But the difficulty is we're, we're kind of going up against the economic grain, whereas previously there yeah. was an economic logic in going up yeah. the ladder. This time, there's no economic logic. And so you have to try and build out the economic logic. Some people, you know, economists like the idea of carbon taxes, and there's other ways you can incentivize people to kind of go down there. But again, it's it's tricky. It's, it's going to be it's going to be really tricky, and there's no yeah. escaping it. But what's exciting, actually incredibly exciting, is that... There are always naysayers out there who say that the technology is not going to help. But the latest um, International Energy Agency projections of where we are right now in terms of carbon emissions, in terms of global warming, um, suggest we are already on a much better path. We're already emitting less than we should have been at this stage. We're already heading for a much lower um, kind of level of of warming, still higher than anyone would like, but lower than it would have been otherwise, purely because of technology because of better solar panels because of better wind because of more batteries like it's happening that this this is actually happening it's not just an idea it's tangible it's there it's physical and it's happening and that's just amazing and that's exciting we're living through a genuine you know this this it does feel like a revolution to some extent and it is an industrial revolution in order to get to net zero we have to reimagine how we make everything because as you'll you know as you'll have seen from reading the book the, the 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 manufacture of anything you know concrete um steel those are obvious yeah. things but even silicon chips even solar panels it all involves a lot of emissions along the way like it or not yeah. and we need to rethink all of this stuff but it's happening it's happening yeah. and, and that's an amazing imaginative um and scientific leap that, and an economic leap that we're going through at the moment and i'm always surprised that people aren't more kind of you know just so excited about it all the yes. time because it is exciting yeah. and there's there's hope there's opportunities there's jobs that yes there's challenges for old jobs as well but there's big opportunities out there uh, and at the end of it we potentially get a more sustainable pla- a planet that's more kind of in balance and maybe we have more plentiful energy as well and so yeah. all of those things together i think are incredibly exciting um and so i think it's easy to be a doomsayer given that there's all, all these challenges out there but the logic actually also points towards being really optimistic. It's not just it's not just hope. It's not just you know yeah. delusion. There is genuine evidence that things are improving, and that that's that's so cool, isn't it? And that's that's really happening. That is not only extraordinarily cool, but it's a brilliant way to round up. What I hope is our first conversation. <laughs> I, I'm always always keen to, to come back. We we do that full episode on concrete uh next think, time. I think we I want to do a five ready hour for episode on concrete. Yeah yeah. Five. Okay. All right we'll do five if you need to if, if you're gonna trim it down to five then we'll by trim all means. it right down to five. <laughs>
No, it, it's been an, a genuine joy talking to you. Uh, we, we, have to, you. we have to rearrange things, but brilliant to have you on the show and please do come back as soon as you can and let's 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 you. talk thank concrete you. <laughs> thank you really hope you enjoyed that uh, i'd love to tell you some more facts and, and figures and staggering things it's really worth reading the book i haven't finished it yet i'm really looking forward to it i've read the oil chapter so i cheated i went forward a bit and read the oil chapter and how how lucky we are at when I'm recording this, because the oil industry and the oil distribution network around the world is still functioning. By the time you hear this, maybe that's changed. Let's seriously hope not. Uh, on that rather chilling note, uh, that's all we've got time for. Please do uh, join us next time, next week indeed, for another fabulous uh, edition of the Fully Charged Show podcast. But from that, for now, as always, if you have been, thank you for listening. <laughs>